Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yael Roger, and I'm excited to tell you about my recent project on the genetic management of button wrinkle wart. So by now, you will have gained an understanding of the importance of genetic management and conservation. We know that maintaining genetic diversity and evolutionary processes such as gene flow is critical for biodiversity conservation. But how do we really go about planning successful genetic management interventions? Well, the most important factor for effective management is the informed choice of individuals used for the translocations or restorations. These individuals should be sufficiently genetic di divergent to introduce new beneficial alleles and increase genetic divergence the diversity, but not so divergent as to cause outbreeding depression. And making an informed choice like this necessitates a detailed understanding of the population genetic structure, levels of diversity, as well as the evolutionary processes underlying those patterns. For example, we can get signals of population differentiation and structure from both long-term divergence and genetic drift in the short term as a result of recently isolated populations. And if we were to manage those populations separately based on the incorrect assumption that they have adaptively diverged over a long period of time, we would actually be increasing their extinction risk by perpetuating that isolation and loss of genetic diversity through further drift. And that brings me to my talk um, about my study species this gorgeous little grassland daisy that I will use to demonstrate the importance of determining these factors for the effective genetic management of a threatened species. So Rutidosis leptorynchoides, or hereafter Rutidosis, is a perennial daisy once common in grassy systems in southeastern Australia. But since European settlement, its habitat has been reduced to about 99% um, of its original and its range constricted to about 30 isolated wild populations in southern Victoria and ACT New South Wales. Some populations have already gone extinct and the species is listed as endangered. The species is self-incompatible and has been shown to be suffering from genetic problems related to small population size and fragmentation. Genetic rescue has been recommended for this species and without it, many small populations Will go extinct, especially in Victoria, where only three small diploid populations remain. So previous research on the genetics of the species had sampled populations across its distribution in Victoria and ACT New South Wales, and there is a large break in this species distribution where there are no um, populations. Using nine alizyme loci and ten microsatellites, they found low levels of differentiation among the sample populations, despite this large break. And we can see from this tree that the Victorian populations, um, which are surrounded by the black box, are just interspersed with the ACT New South Wales populations. And this was interpreted as suggesting a high degree of gene flow, at least until recently. But the lack of strong population uh, subdivision could also suggest that the populations were once very connected by gene flow, but this connectivity has since ceased due to fragmentation. So population genetic data sets with greater resolution are required to really assess the differentiation more accurately. Also, we need a detailed understanding of which populations are the most genetically diverse and which populations are the most vulnerable in order to prioritize conservation management. And that's where my study comes in. I sampled 12 uh, populations across the distribution of the species and obtained a large, high quality uh, data set of 13,000 SNPs from diversity arrays technology. And first up, to, I looked at the genetic structure of the 12 populations with an analysis called principal component analysis, which shows how the genetic, differentiate, the genetic variation is distributed and it ranks the strongest splits on each axis. So we can see that the um, PC1, the first axis, axis explaining um, the most variation, splits the Victorian populations TR and SA from the rest of ACT New South Wales. The second um, axis then um, splits these smaller populations of MI and DB from the other um, northern populations, and further splits of um, individual populations can be seen on other axes. But the big takeaway here is that 
the strongest um, split is between Victorian and ACT New South Wales populations. I then looked at how levels of genetic diversity are distributed among the populations. And I found that in fact, the two small and declining populations in Victoria, TR and SA, actually have the highest levels of genetic diversity across the species range. In contrast, small populations um, from the Northern uh, range, BB and MI, for example, actually had the lowest levels of genetic diversity. Whereas previous research on this species had indicated that genetic diversity is correlated to population size, and they recommended that um, conservation management be prioritized on large genetically diverse populations. And by that thinking, a population, for example, like MJ, which has about 28,000 individuals, we would have expected that to be really genetically diverse. But using our large SNP data set, we see that that's not the case. And there's no correlation between population size and genetic diversity. And most importantly, we've highlighted that these um, TRNSA in Victoria are the most diverse, even though they're really small. And given the results for genetic diversity and differentiation, we may naturally ask whether the more differentiated populations are that way because they have unique variation that has made them really different to the other populations. And we can test this by regressing estimates of genetic diversity and um, a measure of population-specific variation differentiation. And when we do this for rutidosis, we see that in fact, the more differentiated populations have the lower genetic diversity. And this leads us to believe that populations are becoming more differentiated simply through the loss of variation and genetic drift. All right, now we understand um, what's going on currently in the populations, but what about historically? To do this, I use the cool software called SNAP, which builds evolutionary trees, similar to the one I showed you previously, um, but this one is based on SNPs. And each colored line you see here uh, represents the ancestry of one SNP. The lines in blue are the most frequent trees found, the next most frequent are red, and the third most frequent are green. Then the black lines represent the consensus tree, and the numbers on top of those lines represent um, the confidence in each of those branches, ranging from zero to one, and this is called the posterior pro probability. And we can see here that there was very strong support um, for a uh, probability of one, to be exact, for the genetic split between um, the Victorian populations and all Northern populations. And this means that the split we found in our other analyses is likely to have been there for a very long time. So to summarize, my main findings were as follows. Firstly, we found this major split between northern um, populations and southern populations, which actually reflects the geography and can be seen in other species. And this was actually not found um, in research using the lower resolution markers such as allozymes and microsatellites. And it has a really important, um, it has really important implications for how we genetically manage the populations. We found that um, the small, there are small isolated populations at risk of extinction in ACT New South Wales. They're becoming more differentiated um, through the loss of genetic diversity um, by genetic drift. And this work has resulted in um, restoration activities um, being undertaken at some of these small um, declining uh, populations in New South Wales. Finally, we found that small Victorian populations actually contain the highest amounts of genetic diversity and highlighted them as really important genetic resources for the conservation of the species. And that has led to the prioritization of these um, populations, the collection of seeds for the establishment of nursery um, collections, further restoration. In um, conclusion, I'd like to thank everyone involved in this project and uh, thank you for listening.